Uh, that was bracing. They don't like it when you shoot at them. I worked that out myself. Did you find Vitelli? Vitelli's out of it. Bumblebee laid down arms, the first sign of inevitable crushing defeat. Can you imagine such a cowardly creature? Firefly, or The Space Cowboy Show. You've most likely heard some interesting, even contradictory things about it. My friend told me it was her favorite show, and that I shouldn't watch it. Years later, after asking many other fans, I can say that not only was my introduction not unusual, it was fairly common. And somehow this is just the beginning of the strangeness. But before we begin to grapple with the show's bizarre reputation, and the reason this introduction is so common, let's start by looking at the show proper. Firefly is a show about time. It begins with a bang, it gallops along like a hero, and then, out of nowhere, it ends. But it doesn't waste a minute of the time it's been given. See, I'm not sure when you're watching this, but one of the most surprising aspects of living now for me in the year 2039 is my strange new relationship with time. At the moment, we're all stuck inside, waiting until it's safe to leave our bunkers, and despite running low on every other resource, from food to general patience, the one thing I think we have too much of is time. Which means you can write your book, or play Dark Souls, or make those internet videos you wanted to make when you were younger, back when YouTube was a huge deal. And you can finally watch all those gritty shows you've been meaning to get around to, or in my case, attempting to, and instead re-watching Joss Whedon's Firefly. And I finally figured out why I keep doing that. See, Firefly is an obscure space western that was cancelled after one season. Kind of. Not really. We'll come back to that. It combines genre conventions of the late- You know what? No. No. Firefly is about cowboys in space, okay? I, I need you to understand that. It's about cowboys having adventures in space. I honestly don't know why we're not all doing backflips right now. The premise is goofy fun and the show revels in it. Psychic though? That sounds like something out of science fiction. You live in a spaceship, dear. So? It has shootouts and waltzes, it has old-timey guns and space lasers. It has adorable moments and genuine terrors. It really is one of those rare creations that feels like it has a little something for everyone. Well, on a scale of 1 to the Princess Bride, I give it a something for everything rating of about 8. It has some points removed, maybe don't watch it with your parents. And similar to the dialogue of Aaron Sorkin, it has a distinct rhythm and sarcasm that can repel people. That young man's very brave. Yeah. He's my hero. If you have not seen Firefly, I recommend it. And I made this video so I can explain why the show is so passionately beloved. And if you have seen it, that's even better. I made this because I can't find discussions online that explore how well-crafted the character work, world-building, and themes of the show are, so I went ahead and made it. Firefly has a more uniquely positive outlook than most reviewers care to explain, and darker political and historical connotations than people will explore or even admit. I'll be discussing character and world-building stuff that's much better discovered on the show's terms, but I'll avoid unnecessary spoilers where I can. And if you haven't seen it, the best case scenario is that you'll pause this video when you've been convinced and go watch it yourself. The sooner the better. With that being said, let's look at the first sentence I used. Firefly is an obscure space western that only had one. I don't like this sentence. Like most descriptors of Firefly, it has a loose relationship with the truth. So let's fix it. First, Firefly isn't really an obscure show anymore. It used to be. It really was a cult classic for a few years there, but it's been nearly four decades. At a certain point, us dorks who enjoy finding hidden gems need to take a second and notice how many of us are here in the same room. Nowadays, if you mention the word Firefly in a bunker full of eight nerds, at least one of them will begin to vibrate. Two, if I snuck in. That's mostly due to its quality and appeal, but it also owes a lot to being perhaps the most famous cancelled too soon show of all time. Even today, when there's a show that looks like it might be cancelled, there's always a comment somewhere about it being the next Firefly. This naturally advertises the show in a peculiar way. Other than that, Firefly is famous for a boatload of reasons. It was an early project of director Joss Whedon of Mickey Mouse's Avengers. You see jokes about its cancellation across a lot of places. Me and Ivan have an agreement. If one of us dies, we stage it to look like a suicide caused by the unjust cancellation of Firefly. We're gonna get that show back on the air, buddy. Also, NASA made this. Heck, we took the DVDs into space. I'm not sure what point we admit that it's at least found an audience, but I think we passed it a while ago. Certainly it took a while, but it's more recognized now than a lot of the most viewed shows of its era. Like, when was the last time you heard someone talk about, um, the, the football show? Is that the Ted Lasso thing? Second, let's look at the other descriptive space western. This is mostly true. It fits that genre, being a romanticized construction of a lawless frontier where everything seems up for grabs. Cowboy Bebop is a space western. The Mandalorian is a space western. But because the frontier is just a starting point for Firefly's world building, a more precise description of what Firefly is doing is post-American Civil War in space. It's an interesting subspecies of the Western. It's got pseudo-Civil War garb after a brutal conflict between a failed revolutionary conglomerate and a unifying superior force. And this past war isn't just some cute background lore, it's a central element of Firefly stories. It matters a lot to these characters. And finally, Firefly didn't get one season. 
because there is no season finale of Firefly. It was abruptly cancelled midway through filming the first season and ended at 14 episodes. And wouldn't you believe it, the guys over at marketing said that complete tests better than half a season. A finished season one would have had more episodes, so it's half a season. In total, there are 14 44-minute episodes of Firefly, and a conclusive film, which is a decent amount of time to spend with these characters. This isn't some tragic, incomplete pilot episode, no matter what complaints you hear from us fans, don't listen to us. Heck, ABC gave Max Hedrum exactly the same amount of screen time, 14 44-minute episodes, and they described that as two seasons, despite the fact that in all those episodes nothing really happens. Firefly is filled with game-changing things happening every episode, which goes to show that one season is not not a standard unit of measurement, mathematically or narratively. The show doesn't waste any of the time it has been given. These episodes are a genuine odyssey of adventures. Fan complaints of its brevity are mostly a result of the show's unrealized potential. Alright, I feel better about that sentence now. We did it. We saved the sentence. But now that we've got some of the misconceptions out of the way, we get to look at the show now. Firefly follows the adventures of nine characters on a spaceship as they go about surviving on the outskirts of the law. The captain, Malcolm Reynolds, and his first mate, Zoe, are both veterans of a recent civil war. They are quite bummed about it, no matter what they claim. Sergeant. It's not Sergeant. Not anymore. War's over. For some, the war will never be over. The ship they fly, the titular Firefly-class vessel, is their opportunity for freedom from their past. As they travel, they pick up several other scrappy characters to fly with them. They have a gifted mechanic, a pilot, a giant muscle of a man who is good at rough work, and a... Alright, I need to choose my words carefully here. Uh, she's a companion, which is a sex worker who is heavily unionized and also a high-ranking member of society. So despite the historical implications of the old-timey overalls and guns, in this world she's actually the most immediately respectable member of the crew in the eyes of space society. Anyway, the first episode of Firefly has them gaining three new members of their ship. A mysterious Christian priest, a doctor on the run, and a savant younger sister who seems to be enormously important to the space government and has just been given superpowers. It's not entirely clear what these sci-fi superpowers are, but you get hints as the show goes on. Girl is a witch. Yeah, but she's our witch. So now they're all aboard the ship, doing crime and avoiding the steadily expanding space government. It's simple, it's to the point, it's great. And it immediately lends itself to episodic storytelling. Here they are on this planet, here they are on another. And while it can immediately be appreciated by anyone looking to see cowboys in space, the central strength of Firefly is, above all else, its spectacular emphasis on character. In a way that I think, honestly, Firefly is a gold standard for character group dynamics. Firefly has nine central characters, and all of them are interesting. As separate entities, you have a real medley of personality here, from the atheist to the pious, the aggressive to the pacifistic, the brutal to the utterly helpless. You okay? I think I've been kidnapped. Yeah. There's always a character for you to relate to. I use the term separate entities because if you look at these characters like separate toys inside the show package, you miss out on the most interesting part, the relationships between them. Because Firefly is not a list of nine characters, it's a web. This show is my go-to example of using a cluster of people interacting to make more than the sum of its parts. So instead of looking at the characters individually, let's look at the space between them. Knowing me, knowing you. Uh -huh. Now, let's get the word character all sorted out so it makes sense when I praise the crew of Firefly. Because while there is no chance of my being refuted, there is a chance of my being misunderstood. Yeah, I'm totally joking, but that is an actual Kant quote, and it's the most arrogant thing I've read in my life. Anyway, when I hear the term good character in film reviews and even just talking with friends, I always feel like a literal translation for what I'm hearing is, I would enjoy talking to this character for a while. The word sounds like it's used to judge a character's likability in a very static way that almost feels like the character's purpose is to entertain the viewer personally. I want to emphasize here that it really isn't. The purpose of a character is to support the story around them. I mean, sure, you can appreciate a character for their likability or complex entertainment turmoil or whatever, but at the end of the day, these puppets gotta mean something and support a story. I don't need to love you, I don't even need to understand you, but your story is conveying things to me and you gotta help, tickety talk! Not to be fair, this likability watermark, this question of would this character make an interesting dinner guest, is a serviceable test. It certainly weeds out weak characters, I personally feel like there would be a lot of silence if I had to have dinner with anyone here. But strong characters aren't isolated performances, they are pieces of a puzzle. And I can actually prove this, with science. William, I defend narrative arguments, science. All Shakespearean characters are good, and it isn't because I want to have dinner with them. I don't even like the friar, for example, the priest character in Romeo and Juliet. Remember, you actually got cast as him in the school play, even though you wanted to kiss someone on stage, and you thought this was just a forgettable background character, but you were wrong, because this character is incredibly important. The friar can be read in a lot of different ways. If you're an actor, you have a lot of different strategies for performing these lines. Maybe you read him as the well-intentioned friend of Romeo. 
Fine. Or you could lean into how exasperated he is by this idiot. You were in love with Rosalind yesterday and you want to get married today? What is wrong with you? Hey, I've known Romeo since he's a kid. You could do a lot better. Listen to me. You could do a lot better. Or you could be a holy agent of understanding, just the nicest father figure in the world. Or maybe he isn't exasperated and he thinks all this is perfectly fine. Nothing's wrong. This marriage will work. Juliet's safe. You know, just a moron. Or what if he knows this can't possibly work because Juliet and Romeo are children and the families despise each other. So he's sacrificing these two for the people of Verona. Evil priest. Of course, if you've read the text, at least one of these interpretations probably reads as a gross perversion of the character. That's fine, the last one probably is. If you think your interpretation is so special though, defend it. What, fight me, buddy. But to do that, you inevitably have to explain how you understand Romeo and the conflict of the families. This marriage, this plan, Verona, love, and oh my gosh, look, we've been tricked. This puffed up Pop and Jay tricked us into grappling with the deepest themes of the play, and now you're thinking about your parents' divorce, and all you wanted was to find out if you should read the friar with a funny voice. This one character helps the entire play, and every character in Shakespeare is like this. My point isn't that they're unlikable, though they sometimes are, or complex, though they are, but that their actions complicate and illustrate the larger themes of their respective stories. Shakespeare isn't prioritizing whether I like the friar. He's prioritizing the larger play and making the friar a conduit for larger themes. The sum has to be larger than the parts, the story is more important than likability. And you know who else isn't likable and helps the larger story? Jane! Jane sucks. But I enjoy Jane as a character more with every rewatch. He's not empathetic to me, but he adds so much to the story. He is such a bully, and he's gross. Not Hollywood, my hands are dirty too gross, but like, actually gross. He is immoral and self-interested and just so wonderfully dumb and unaware of his stupidity. Notice how he carries himself like he's the big brain genius of the crew. If you remove Jane, the whole crew would start to feel a lot less like space pirates. By having him always there suggesting that they just take the money and run now, we remember that these are ruffians, and he allows the group members to discuss their morality. If you remove Jane from the team, I promise you that Malcolm wouldn't be forced to demonstrate his moral fiber just to keep this ape in check. You turn on any of my crew, you turn on me! Also, I cannot praise Adam Baldwin's performance as Jane enough here. He's hilarious. But alright, I admitted earlier that likability is a serviceable watermark, so if you want to judge Firefly characters by how they are to talk with one-on-one, -on -one, they totally pass that test. And you know what? Happy birthday! <laughs> There is a scene in which each character is interrogated individually by the villains. They are vibrant and alive and everything you'd want in a writing exercise demonstrating strong characters. But I want to make it clear that even in this setting, this peculiar rare case in which you have them ask the same questions, most of the humor in the scene is derived from these quick jump cuts between them showing how different they are from each other. Is there any particular reason you don't wish to discuss your marriage? We're very private people. The legs. Oh yeah, I definitely have to say it was her legs. You can put that down. Let's look again at this diagram I made, and I'm sure no one will find things they disagree with. You've got paternal care, and romance, and competition, and sibling caretaking. It's great. This web is actually a better character model for me than any list of attributes I could assign to the people here. What, you want me to describe the ship doctor, Simon, as caring, awkward, clever, ripped? What is this, amateur hour? No, to explain Simon, I need to tell you that he gave up everything, his money, his career, his home, to take care of his sister, River. I don't think of Simon as a good doctor. I think of him as a good brother, in a way that I just hadn't seen in a show before. River's mind works differently than others. Some manifestations of this may seem similar to others in our world, but the show is pretty upfront that this is someone who has had futuristic sci-fi surgery in our brain for sci-fi reasons. I'm not the right person to ask how much of River's condition overlaps with other real-world brains, but in terms of the space between these two people, the reality of what this relationship is is quite recognizable to someone who may have had to take care of a family member. For whatever missteps this show might make, and perhaps I'm missing many I wouldn't know, this is the first time I had ever seen the quiet heroism of what it means for someone to take care of a family member who is mentally in a much different place than those around them. When I think about Simon, and when I think about River, I remember that the show was willing to have the final scene in one of the most bombastic, over-the-top heist episodes I've ever seen be a quiet moment in which Simon finds a new medication for River. This new drug may help her live comfortably without the nightmares that have been causing her distress. It's not a sure thing, and it's certainly not described as a cure, but it's possible progress for someone that deserves care. It's gentle and beautiful, and it demonstrates a surprising amount of empathy I didn't expect in my show about space cowboys. My point is that Simon's character isn't bestowed upon him by many other characters describing him over and over again, it's determined by his actions. And for a show primarily famous for being too short, it's baffling to me that there are more character decisions and unique relationships packed into these episodes than most multi-season telecasts. So, you there. See what relationship you personally relate to, and which side of it you empathize with. Have you ever had a crush on someone, particularly someone who seems to have grown up in a higher social standing than you? Then you'll immediately relate to Kaylee. Are you in a relationship and worry your spouse will never be ready to have children with you? Try Zoe. Have you been bullied? 
Try Simon. Does everyone think you suck? Try Jane! A lot of times relating to characters isn't just, hey, I like dancing too, it's recognizing yourself on either side of a dynamic. Consider the show's captain, Malcolm Reynolds. He's known Zoe, his first mate, the longest. They fought together in the war. The strength and trust of this bond has an interesting result. It actually creates conflict with the ship's pilot, Wash, Zoe's husband, over their lives under Malcolm's leadership. See, Wash is a good pilot and likes being in control. He dislikes not being in control. So naturally, he dislikes that the captain has final say in every waking hour of the time Zoe and Wash have together. But see, that's just the surface of one relationship. Malcolm is also passive-aggressive with Priest due to his loss of faith in the war. Active-aggressive with Jane due to his insistence on moral principle over immediate gain. Landlord and weary guide to Simon. And at his most paternal and caring towards Kaylee, our favorite ship mechanic, because how can you not love Kaylee? She is unrelentingly positive no matter how terrible things seem. And despite a poorly hidden crush, he has a lot of conflict with Nara, who is in many ways his opposite. He doesn't like corporate groups, she is in union. He fought for the brown coats, she opposed them. He's an atheist, she's a Buddhist. He was a punk, she did ballet. These are, of course, oversimplified, and nearly every one of these can be expanded upon, but it begins to show how complicated this all is. And that's just one of the nine characters. The more I expand on each of these, the more I have to explain the characters on either side of these lines and the fabric of the show's themes. Like William Science does. This is efficient storytelling. You establish a relationship, you have immediate drama, and you get a whole new light on both sides of these lines. Now let's forget character arcs and development for a moment and focus on character, like it's a static entity. By lighting a face from different angles and colors, you can entirely change what it looks like. It's somehow still the same face, but we accentuate different parts of it. It's useful to think of the relationships in the same way. Way. More relationships, more light, more face. If you only ever have your character interact with one person in a specific relationship, you only have one light illuminating it. This usually presents one-dimensional characters. Now, some characters are perfectly fine with one light. I don't need to see Christopher Nolan's Joker in any other way. He treats everyone the same, and everyone treats him the same. He's a mysterious agent of chaos, and an effective foil against a famous business owner with a secret identity. But for most cases, you want more than one light. You want to see a diversity of relationships. Malcolm Reynolds has eight other lights shining on him, showing his different angles, from his command of brutal leadership when necessary to a surprising playfulness. What the hell's going on in the engine room? Were there monkeys? Some terrifying space monkeys maybe got loose? Now, for fun. Take out your pad and quill and consider your favorite characters. Be, be honest with yourself and start drawing connections to the people they interact with. Go ahead. Go nuts. Here, because I can't hear you, I'll go first, and you can go later, I guess, if you if you want to. I'm, I mean, you don't have to. Breaking Bad's Walter White is a strong character because we see so many different sides of him. How does he interact with his former student, Jesse? How about his son? His wife. How does he treat Gus Fring? How about his brother-in-law, a DEA agent hot on his trail? Putting aside how much these relations change over the seasons, each of these people see a surprisingly different Walter. Walter White cannot be understood entirely just by seeing one of these alone, even though they each may have a separate truth about him. It's only with a healthy collection of lighting that you see something true about Walter White, no matter what he claims to be to different people. Think of your favorite characters, and I think you'd be surprised that you can learn just as much seeing them talk to strangers as to their closest family. Of course, situations can draw out different aspects of characters, and I could talk a while about my theory that good world building allows an environment to be a character, but that's not important right now. Let's let's keep it simple. Now, given these successful examples I've been talking about, I bet I know what you're thinking, and it disgusts me. You're probably thinking that all this sounds easy, aren't you? That all you need to do is have a large number of characters talk to each other, and these relationships will just pop out of the ground naturally, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Nowadays, most workplace comedies have this baseline default they settle into after their first season or two where every relationship boils down to irritated co-worker. The show Archer has a lot of positives, but after the first few episodes promising some relationships, and certainly by the time it reaches Firefly's 11 hour mark, all of the cast relationships have become flat. They are all now just irritated co-workers. None of these characters really care for one another at this point, they don't meaningfully interact, and I'm pretty sure they would give each other up in a second. Oh wait, I'm a genius, that actually happens. They all sell each other out to the FBI. Season 5, Episode 1. Archer himself frustrates and irritates basically everyone around him. It's the same relationship through many people. Really, think about how many comedies have people that aren't exactly friends, they're just kind of indifferent peers. Why do we even hang out with him anyway? Hello? I've been saying this for years! I'm not saying it's not funny, I'm just saying narratively it's kind of boring. Now, just because you prefer big budget dramas doesn't mean you're safe. Dramas actually can't help doing this either. But instead of constant comedic irritation, it relies on constant power imbalance. I rewatched the first season of House of Cards, and I cannot stress enough that nearly every scene is two people speaking and trying to shift the power balance between them or others. It might feel different at times with different subjects, settings, intimidation, betrayal, but it's nearly always the same relationship. I, I don't think this is necessarily lazy writing. I understand 
why they're doing this. They are portraying a cruel political landscape where these ruthless monsters can outmaneuver everyone to amass more and more power. But I don't think it's my fault when turning on these old episodes and thinking to myself, why do I feel like watching Firefly right now? It's because House of Cards, Archer, a lot of other dramas and comedies suffer from what I'm going to coin as relationship malnutrition. Cameron Barley, 2039. There are wonderful exceptions to this in both shows. I really like Peter Russo meeting with his mother for two short scenes. It both explains an enormous amount about his character and made this later moment when he mirrors her hit like a rock. But individual exceptions aren't enough to carry me through several seasons. I need more of these. But whatever they did, it wasn't enough! I just wish more shows were built around interesting relationships rather than a collection of zany characters. And to be clear, I'm not telling you not to like things just because they don't have this particular thing. I just am trying to show how unusual Firefly is. Whenever I consider interesting, diverse character relationships, I always go back to these nine characters having adventures in space. Because sure, Zoe is a stoic killer, but her husband and the preacher bring out her softer side. She's come a long way since the war. Zoe got married. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, next you'll be telling me she smiles has emotions. And Jane is a bullying mountain of a man who pushes everyone around, but even he's protective of Kaylee, because of course he is. She sees the best in everyone. And there are so many other examples, it's difficult to really capture the character work happening in every scene. Nearly every line is doing two or three different things, and if it's not world building or narrative, its first priority is always expressing the space between these people. Here's a fantastic benefit of all this work. In basically every story we've ever heard, there's going to be a moment where the characters know something that we, the audience, don't. They live in the story, we're just visiting. It's up to the storyteller to come up with an excuse for us to figure things out, whether visually or whatever your medium does best. And usually, a character just has to say what's going on out loud so that we, the audience, can hear it. Now, exposition is an example of this, but that's just a part of what I'm describing. Wizards just need to tell Harry Potter what's going on because we sure as heck don't know. You can't apparate in the castle grounds, Harry. If you'd read Hogwarts of History once, you'd know this. So how do we do this? Well, when done best, it makes sense with the character. aang has been a popsicle for a hundred years. He needs the others to explain what the heck happened to the world while he was gone. At worst, I'm suddenly realizing that it doesn't make sense for Dr. Manhattan to explain to, of all people, his girlfriend how his future vision works? Sally, you've been living with this man for 20 years. How do you not know this? The thing I adore about Firefly is that every time a character has to explain something to another, it makes perfect sense. Always. Heck, it's actually interesting why they're asking, because every crew member has areas of expertise and areas that they are totally clueless about. Simon knows medicine, and because he was a sheltered medical prodigy, he therefore knows nothing about how life works in the rough-and-tumble world he's entering. Can I see a menu? What? Meanwhile, Kaylee is an expert mechanic. When things go wrong on the ship, and oh boy do they, she's in charge. But she doesn't know the first thing about high-class balls and galas, which is a problem when they need to blend in for a prospective client. Inara knows balls and galas and fencing, a high-class dueling system, which Malcolm needs to learn, and so on forever. I could do this with every character, and it even has fun little extras. Shepard seems innocent, but why does he have such shady information memorized? One day you're gonna tell us all how a preacher knows so damn much about crime. It would have been so easy to make a crew member designated dumb Bo Mick asks too many questions. Mia Mia? What's Mia Mia? But no, in Firefly, every character gets their turn to pass the flow of information. In this show, even the simple act of letting the audience know what the heck is going on helps to demonstrate who these characters are. This also has the added bonus of making every character on the ship rather equal in utility and power. Having a character know something the other doesn't kind of naturally makes one more commanding. Knowledge is power, listen to the Swamp Muppet. He knows what's up. If you don't believe me, try this thought exercise. Imagine being at a car mechanic and them asking if you know what a C-clip under your left wheel is. Do you? A. Feel powerful. Or B. Feel like someone who's about to lose $600. The answer is B. If Dummy McIntern person was walking around the ship asking questions for the audience, they'd immediately be less useful than everyone around them. Instead, the show values its crewmates quite equally, and it permits them to help one another. And oh, look, they're, they're not fighting, they're playing sports ball together. Why can't all shows be like this? Next time you're watching Firefly, pay attention to the flow of information, and notice how every new situation gives different crewmates opportunities to educate the others. For a show that is exceedingly goofy, often glib, and always about two seconds away from a sarcastic quip, I have no problem pointing to this as a model of group dynamics. People have this idea that Mickey Mouse took a big risk on giving Avengers, the largest film crossover event at the time, to a relatively unknown Joss Whedon, but it makes a lot of sense to me. New Line Cinema giving Peter Jackson The Lord of the Rings was a huge risk. Giving Sam Raimi Spider-Man was also a gamble. But if I was sitting in a room trying to figure out who could handle the different tones and group dynamics of Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, and Hulk fighting aliens, I'd probably nominate the guy who spearheaded Firefly. Pretty cunning, don't you think? Anyway, without going too much into each character and what I enjoy so much about them individually, I'd like to wrap up this perspective 
perspective on character and focus now on the world of Firefly. What was this war? Why are they outlaws? What the heck is going on with these cows in space? See, I married me powerful, ugly creature. How can you say that? How can you shame me in front of new people? There aren't many stories like Firefly. It might not seem that way at first. My invocation of cowboys in space actually isn't entirely uncommon either before or after Firefly. But once you start opening up the realities of what this world is invoking, what it's saying, you actually have something quite unexpected to grapple with. Hmm. The world of Firefly has the two best qualities you can have in a fictional universe. It is intuitively understandable the first time you watch it, and it has some fun details for repeat viewings. The original Star Wars has some similar positives. You don't need nerds explaining the Horus heresy to understand that these are space fascists. Literal dogs understand that this is a bad dude. Until I have more information, I'm gonna side with the hippie space wizards who don't seem to be fascists. But if you want more info, and you'll never believe this, I have in fact heard rumors, whispers of an extended universe in which you may in fact learn more about Star Wars wars beyond the films. I know, I'm as shocked as you are. Anyway, Firefly has Civil War era weaponry, clothes, we've got a bloody war for unification, romanticized Wild West era gunfights, and our heroes have southern accents. Thought you were leaving anyhow. Wait a minute. Southern, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. It's not at all what you think. Okay, see, this is where our space cowboys get complicated. Let's tread carefully from this point. The protagonists of the show were fighting for the losing side. Is this show a romanticization of the American Confederacy? To understand Firefly's politics, which are interesting, you have to focus in on this question. Firefly has a whole lot of political purpose to itself, a huge amount actually, and if I don't get this sorted out, everything I say after this point is going to seem like contradictory nonsense. Um, I'm lost. Uh, I'm angry. And I'm armed. So. And the world of Firefly is goofy enough to make the genre setting far subtler than I'm making it sound. Western genre films haven't been mainstream for decades, and while they would often have Civil War veterans, you'd be forgiven for thinking this show was purely about the wild, wild west. I'm going to simplify this a lot, because every moment I talk about the Civil War, or as us learned men call it, Bleeding Kansas 2, Electric Boogaloo, The National Tour, I'm not talking about cowboys in space. And what kind of host would I be if I did that? There's no denying that, aesthetically, the protagonists of Firefly are inspired by Southerners after a Civil War. The writers have said this several times. I'm not sure if other countries are going to get this, but this is a pretty intense decision immediately. See, the American Civil War doesn't sit comfortably in the past of America. It hugely informs modern politics. If Pearl Harbor happened 4,000 years ago, this sometimes feels like it happened yesterday. We don't often tell stories about this war because it's not a heroic moment in our history. It killed an enormous amount of our total population, and we weren't fighting another nation, we were fighting ourselves. It split the nation in half in ways that are felt generations later, and the writings of our southern states explaining the reasons for secession plainly detail the difficult, troubling assumptions of our ancestors, from the cornerstone speech to the declaration of causes of seceding states. At worst, this was the nation imploding internally, and at best, even if you understand this war as a victory that provided a completion to the humanitarian goals of abolitionists, this was still only the beginning. It would be a hundred years before even Martin Luther King Jr. It was very bad for a long time. Now this got pretty historical, and I know what you're thinking. Where did the space cowboys go? Here we go, they're back on screen, don't worry. We've done our homework, and now we can play outside. Metaphorically, don't actually go outside. People revisiting Firefly Now may wonder whether a show released in 2002 is participating in a surprisingly common practice of romanticizing this historical faction. And when I say common practice, I don't mean Gone with the Wind, I mean the Muppet show. So let's address this. Vague genre set dressing like this can be useful for understanding a fictional situation quickly. Tolkien may not have liked historical illusion, but we know exactly what illustrator Alan Lee was doing with these orcs. Pickle hat, got it. However, genre aesthetics are, by definition, not the final word on morality. See, whether or not your characters are literally called stormtroopers, fascists are determined by their actions rather than their clothes. I'm not shallow. I don't hate the Empire because they dress like this. It's because they kill civilians, and Darth Vader chokes people who bring him bad news. Boo. Considering this, I've rewatched the show and carefully compiled a full list of everything the Firefly Rebels, the Brown Coat Movement, and the historical Confederate States of America have in common. And that's the list. The show never really goes into the politics of the war, but the show heavily suggests that Malcolm Reynolds is the ultimate brown coat, someone who truly believed in their cause. Seems odd you name your ship after a battle you're on the wrong side of. May have been the losing side. Still not convinced it was a wrong one. Unless we were to see some evidence of some planned later season arc in which Malcolm were to grapple with his differences from the brown coats, we must assume that Malcolm and the brown coats are synonymous. By this metric, we have a simple conclusion. The brown coats are kind of the ideological opposite of the American Confederacy. I say this because Malcolm Reynolds is one of the most libertarian characters in fiction, and that doesn't mesh at all with the genre metaphor that suggests he fought for the Confederate States of America. Say what you will about libertarians, thank you I will, but the Confederacy was many things, basically none of them were libertarian. But let's get our terms in order. What do I mean by libertarian? 
They don't like the government trying to do things. No, but really, in theory, libertarians are invested in personal liberty more than anything else. They don't like or trust intervention in their personal affairs, at least by the government. I think that all government is a waste of taxpayer money. I'm definitely a libertarian. Consenting adults want what they want. And if I'm not supplying it, they will get it somewhere else. Government commandeering your ship, telling you where to go? That's what governments are for, getting a man's way. My idea of a perfect government is one guy, and the only thing he's allowed to decide is who to nuke. This is a vast oversimplification, so don't put too much weight on it. And like every political descriptor, it changes from person to person. It's a caricature of what is a complex political movement that has had many books, leaders changes, and blah, 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 blah. Just keep in mind that phrases like all taxation is theft are popular extreme libertarian positions. So consider that a starting point. And you might be wondering, how does this differ from the belief of anarchists? Oops, my anarchy symbol. Why have libertarians become associated with the political conservatives? How do they feel about economic, religious, and cultural imposition on personal liberties? How do you pronounce this woman's name? Those are some good questions. If you want to find out more, I'd recommend putting on your hazmat suit and visiting what's left of a library. They were these repositories of knowledge before the government withdrew funding. Now, even by this weak definition, the Confederate States of America were not libertarian. Like, not even a little. D minus. It was a government founded when the practice of enslaving human beings was threatened to become not legally enforced. You can't understand the Confederacy as libertarian without considering human beings as a form of property, which contradicts the human rights emphasis against the state. It suspended habeas corpus immediately and jailed political prisoners without trial. It required a domestic passport system to travel anywhere. It conscripted it. it this is a short-lived wartime government. These space cowboys, in direct opposition to all this, believe in individual freedoms in a blunt and simple way. And don't you ever stand for that sort of thing. Someone ever tries to kill you, you try to kill them right back. See, as such, Firefly manifests as an unexpected love letter to libertarian ideology, like the original V for Vendetta is to political anarchy, or Home Alone is to defensive habitation law. It just can't get enough of it. Honestly, I wish there were more stories that chose political stances and adopted them as a central theme in their world building. In a world of repetition, unexpected love letters to political ideologies like Fury Road is to matriarchal rebuilding are really interesting. And you don't have to agree at all with what it's romanticizing, but it can be incredibly informative and entertaining. <laughs> I mean, of course there should be limits, be responsible about it, but aren't you at least kind of interested in seeing a monarchic comedy? An isolationist noir? An oligarchic rom-com? A libertarian space cowboy show? I'm not claiming this was intentional, but for shows about spaceship crews, Firefly manifests as the anti-Star Trek in political terms. Star Trek tells of an enormous, well-crafted government ship. Serenity is a small, cozy ship falling apart. These are well-trained government operatives. This is a rough-and-tumble gang with Jane in it. This is a glorious federal utopia. This is a federally enforced dystopia. They have entirely different political perspectives. For the most part, the Alliance government, the winning side of the war, isn't a cackling evil force. Their outfits aren't intimidating or wicked. They're boring. Like, comically, intentionally boring. Look at them! The government here isn't really malicious. They're mostly just indifferent and bureaucratic. We've got better things to do. So do we. All right, obviously the experiments in River and the giant hidden war crime revealed in the movie are both, you know, evil. But for 95% of their screen time, it's just guys like this being irritating. It's not so much malicious, intimidating villain and more dad and mom aren't home that much and don't understand us. They are wonderfully boring. Notice how the show has a consistently shaky camera, a handy cam footage invoking a more rugged life. However, when we go see what the Alliance are doing, the viewpoint is suddenly lifeless and still, uninterested in what it's viewing. It's such a contrast because usually the camera has a great sense of humor I appreciate a lot. But whenever you see the space bureaucrats, the camera has died. Also, notice how our fearless captain always knows how to handle everything better than the meddling government. As much as the brown coats aren't the Confederacy, the Alliance aren't the historical union. The Alliance in the show is a big dumb government with various levels of autocracy. It's also pretty vague. They might have a monarchy. I'd sure love to find a brand new compression coil for this. Yes, I'd like to be the king of all and didn't even wear a shiny hat. Or a technocracy, or there seems to be a parliament? I don't know. It's incredibly not important. They are straw men created by a libertarian political ideology to play with. Their job isn't even to serve as the central antagonist for most of the episodes, it's mostly to bolster the political position of our hero. Hans, Bobby, I'm your white knight. Show these Californians who's boss, John McClane! Again, you don't have to agree to appreciate the fantasy of this. The series creator Joss Whedon is all for government intervention, and intentionally created a character he disagreed with. But a libertarian worldview, by definition, is so indulgent and fun to play with when combined with a space western. You can't tell me what to do, dad! I mean, 
government. My point is that if this were aiming to just be a story about rebels, it would have been far easier to make the government evil. There are endless stories about the government being good or bad, but there are very few that portray them as incompetent. That's closer to a broader libertarian mindset. Shouldn't we report this? To who? Alliance? Right. They're gonna run right out here, lickety-split, make sure these taxpayers are okay. And we'll have to. And again, I've been trying to be absolutely sure, but the most I can connect the Alliance and the American Union is the term Purple Belly, which is a slight nod to the term for Union soldiers, Blue Belly. Blue Bellies will give you a better burial than I can. This video required a lot of research. All right, super fans, there's exactly one direct named reference to the American Civil War in the entire show, and it's a really interesting one. Can you name it? You have 10 seconds. I lied. The answer is Jubal Early. The historical Jubal Early was a vicious white supremacist, but I repeat myself, a cartoon of a man who somehow distinguished himself from the rest of the Confederate generals for his villainy. The show uses his name for a deranged and cruel bounty hunter with no allegiance to anyone but himself. He likes hurting people and attacks the crew for money. The application of this name to this character, the violent living embodiment of a human rights violation that Malcolm gets to literally expel from his ship, is about as clear a message as can be made on the writer's feelings towards the historical Confederate States of America and Early's legacy. The show makes a point of doing this, and punching slavers in the face. A lot. It's so insistent that it's actually kind of defensive, which I honestly appreciate. The sheer weight of the inheritance of Firefly's influences are not something to take lightly. See, the show romanticizes American Southern culture, Western genre films, and the most hilariously adolescent libertarianism imaginable, which to me is hopefully not synonymous with the four-year Confederate rebellion, despite the show acknowledging the influence. Oh, I get it. The German guy, Mr. Scar, must be the bad guy. As a final note, I really must say, one has to consider what it must be like for the ghost of Jubal Early, a militant white supremacist, to be played by an actor who is... Well, no use beating around the bush, significantly more handsome than he was. <laughs> Alright, we're done with that. Firefly is more than just its wartime history. The framework of Firefly is pretty solid. It's also surprisingly playful. It has a lot of different influences in its world building, making it a more interesting cultural future than just a run-of-the-mill western. There's a lot of eastern inspiration in everything. A lot of crowd shots are filled with interesting little influences. In this future, everything is kind of melted together in a way that isn't really addressed, but kind of accepted. Inara is a Buddhist, the characters eat with chopsticks, and a lot of the characters swear in Mandarin. <laughs> I wish I was somebody else right now. I always notice more on rewatches. There's a lot to appreciate. Well, alright, there could have been more Asian cast members. As in, more than zero. I don't know. Anyway, it's interesting that specific cultures aren't associated with poverty like most dystopian world building. If anything, it seems the Eastern world has gained more powerful influence in the West, but that probably isn't intentional and has more to do with it being easier to access Western props and them spending more time on the poor planets in the show. Fun stuff. Alright, the final element of Firefly's world is also something I find pretty complicated. The show has a relationship with its female characters that's difficult to agree on. Because you either only remember it as being better than everything else that was on TV at the time, or you have a lot to say about Joss Whedon's career. I have a lot of positive things to say about the show, but I gotta admit some foibles. It would take a lot of time to properly discuss Whedon's full career. A lot of time. Firefly is a tiny piece of a large puzzle, and you'd require Buffy, Penny, Black Widow, Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman again somehow, and a lot of accounts of Whedon's character to see the patterns and rhythms to all of them. I tried, but Firefly alone isn't really enough to discuss the more important things. You need to bring in more evidence. Look, Firefly is a great example of a really important rule of media. Sometimes, the best and worst thing you can say about something is that it was culturally progressive for its time. It describes an improvement, a subversion, a shift in cultural velocity to a younger generation that doesn't understand what it was building upon. And the conversation shifts away from the positive things it did to who did it and why, what was forced, and who wanted what from it. And describing intention is more difficult to explain than what is visibly on screen. Firefly responded to a world where shows had one or two poorly written female characters. It had kind elements that blew my mind at the time, but honestly feel like such low bars today. Kaylee is a female engineer, and not one person is snarky to her about that. Fantastic. This was the first time I had seen that in a show. Zoe, being a stoic warrior, was also unusual. River is interesting and can kill everyone, and Inara is in charge for many situations. Half the crew are women, and they all have their own lives. They're all doing different things. Far more than the average show at the time. And while the show was a lot of firsts for people, including me, its progressive elements are louder and more performative than they would be today. This is not effortless progress. There's a definite otherness to the female crewmates that asks for a much different criteria than the men. I can't imagine a feminine version of Malcolm or Jane existing in this world, can you? And both sides of the line are great, but there are two sides. And the idea of Inara's work being harmless and not something to make a big fuss over is approved by most crew members and is quite kind for 2002. But Malcolm does find it gross, and as a whole, the positivity feels a little disingenuous. I don't know. The show has a weird relationship with this stuff. 
I think there's a slight agreement with Malcolm's distaste for it because seduction is understood as a weapon. Maybe the show's writers genuinely agree with the rest of the crew that Inara isn't doing anything wrong. But Malcolm's incessant ridiculing, particularly as flirting, that wouldn't exist in a show made later. The best example of this is when Inara has a female client and the show throws itself a little party as to how unexpected it is to show two girls kissing. I was surprised too. What will the church elders think? But it doesn't do anything with it, just some off-screen help and then that's all over. The, the point was lesbians. Did you guys know that this would eventually become a trope? I'm surprised too, you learn something new every day. I suppose it's the job of the current generation to be cruel towards once progressive works of the past, and that's a task I feel I can't avoid doing, and that makes me sad. If I'm being honest, if you were to defend Firefly's female characters, I would offer reasons for criticism. If you were to attack them, I'd defend them a bit. I can't win, at least not without invoking more about Whedon's other works, and in the immortal words of Richard Nixon, because I can't win, I quit. To wrap this part up, Firefly has almost become an interesting piece of retro-futurism. From the diversity of its cast, the agency of its female characters, and its interest in both invoking and subverting the framework of the Civil War and old Hollywood westerns. I hope this all can begin to explain what makes Firefly interesting, beneath the central focus on character and thrilling space heroics. When watching Firefly, consider the fact that few shows have felt so unmoored in time. It doesn't feel like it was written in either the Civil War, the John Wayne 1970s, the early 2000s, or today. It's somewhere between those four. Its various successes and stumbles make it a show that doesn't just feel like a product of its time. It's a writing team intentionally invoking the past and creating a strange and occasionally accurate prediction of the diverse casts of stories made decades later. That sounds like something out of science fiction. So all right, we've put the framework in place. Now it's time for the most important part. From the framework of libertarianism to the cultural world of these characters, what above all else does Firefly value? And what the heck happened? Come on, really, why was it canceled? I never have to be under the heel of nobody ever again. No matter how long the arm of the Alliance might get, we'll just get ourselves a little further. Let's get to the third part of our initial sentence and focus on the cancelled element. After all I've said in the show's favor, I still understand that many, many people I've spoken with simply don't want to begin a story that doesn't have an ending. I have about six responses to this, but let me start with the base level. Thucydides never got to finish writing History of the Peloponnesian War, and that doesn't stop it from being the greatest history book of all time. But really, more importantly, what makes the journey itself worth it? What makes all this fan crying about the cancelled show worth beginning? I'm telling you why! The answer is Kaylee, alright? It's Kaylee. But let's have some fun with this and pretend the answer isn't Kaylee for a second, and then we'll all act surprised when we get there. Come on, it'll be fun. There's a sense of joyful genre fun in Firefly that is just infectious. And I don't just mean that a cowboy riding a horse can somehow catch up to a man on a hovercraft shooting a laser pistol, though I do mean that as well. The joy is everywhere in the show, not just in the bombastic, but in the quiet and soft. There are all these beautiful little moments emphasizing the small pleasures of life. Firefly's victories are usually more comfortable and intimate than the giant space battles the genre would have you believe are the focus. In Lord of the Rings, it was important for the filmmakers to show that Sam Gamgee and his assistant aren't just saving the world, they're saving the Shire, a small, cozy place that means home to them, a place we've seen in all its beauty and want to defend. In the same way, the crew of the ship are saving their home, a pleasant place with homemade signs and their family on board. They aren't waiting on a lottery ticket or building a business, they're making the best of right now. It's an important message, especially for someone like me, who can easily spend most of my day carefully sacrificing my present in hopes of a brighter future. The crew of this ship are in the aftermath of a devastating conflict and are trying to enjoy their freedom in the moment. This means sports games with no rules, it means poker between people gambling their chores because they have no money, it means river spontaneously dancing in a field of strangers and enjoying the moments outside. Put simply, I don't know how many other fun, goofy genre shows like this also have such a reverence for the simple joys and morality of the common person, whether those people are mechanics or petty criminals. Petty? I didn't mean petty. What did you mean? This is a pastoral romanticization that puts a lot of weight in slowly revealing Mal's personal code. Figuring out his personal creed is a big element of the show's appeal. I might not show respect to your job, but he didn't respect you. That's the difference. Yours. I should have belonged to nobody. Malcolm's decisions and creed are the show's libertarianism, and the focus isn't on the dislike for anyone with authority, it's a distinct love of the commoner. This is not a complex universe of moral grace, this is a libertarian child's toy collection. There's something to be said for the quiet dignity of a doctor practicing the Hippocratic Oath on a man no matter what, even if that person just tried to rat him out to the government, Jane, you're the worst, or Inara bringing the group to stand up for the rights of independent working women, and the search for freedom and dignity, returning to a world as a veteran for the losing side when the world doesn't seem to want you anymore. The episodes are filled with victories that are more soft and true than the guns and spaceships would suggest, and for that I think it deserves enormous respect. Everything good about the show is right there on screen, not vaguely suggested in lore. The character and world building I've been talking about isn't me extrapolating from vague hints, it's presented quite plainly. I'm always surprised when I revisit the show how much of the world is explained through food. 
Why food? Because everyone knows people need to eat food to stay alive. It's totally clear. There's no need for Naboo trade federations, Mr. Lucas. What is what is happening? The currency that the crew get in the first episode looks like gold bars, but it turns out to be rations for hungry settlers. One of those will feed a family for a month. Longer, if they don't like their kids too well. Shepard gives Kaylee a single strawberry as payment, which is apparently a luxury. A few episodes later, we see a buffet table full of it for rich people. Wealth cap. Got it. This birthday cake is made of protein, but it's the thought that counts. The crew can't afford proper baking materials. Everyone gets a few apples after a successful job, and River and Kaylee chase each other around the ship to grab one. How sweet. Zoe is then asked why she and the captain always cut their apples before eating them, which leads to another horrifying war story of apples with explosives in them. This one opening has so many things happening in it that all complement different parts of the show. Character, theme, world building, Kaylee. The world of Firefly is fundamentally a pleasant place to be. The sets and lighting are nice, and I'm always surprised to remember that Firefly is actually really funny. No. If I'm wrong, you best shoot me now. Or we could talk more. What can it be? We're all doomed. Who's flying this thing? Oh, right, that would be me. <coughs> Jay. There's something the captain has to do for himself. No, no, it's not. Oh. These are just the simple ones. My favorite jokes in the show usually take a full episode of tension to set up and are funniest when you understand the characters at work here. Jane. Go play with your rain stick. The show isn't even primarily a comedy. The dramatic moments in the show are frightfully dark, and the horrifying elements are creepy and have more Ridley Scott's alien than you'd expect in your space western. Now, this is a lot, tonally. I personally like tonal combinations like this. I enjoy stories that go full tragedy and comedy, but I completely understand that there are people who would find this uncomfortable. If you can only watch Christopher Nolan films and find everything else tonally inconsistent, this show will kill you. I'll admit here that there are a handful of times that the serious stuff in the comedy is so earnest that it just feels a bit much. We need corn. Jane, your mouth is talking. You might want to look to that. Yeah, there are some groaners. While these quips were actually among my favorite aspects of the show when I first watched it, I think it's actually probably among the weakest now when I'm watching it today, but that's just a preference thing. On the other side of the tonal world, there are a handful of times when the series is just a bit much. Let me be clear again that I'm totally on board with this show 95% of the time and as being dramatic. I can't believe they pulled off this torture scene, but I sometimes wish there was a bit of pullback. I have some smaller criticisms too, nothing too important. The hand-to-hand -hand combat leaves something to be desired, and the musical stings have become quite a relic of their era. Again, the show is aware of its own goofiness, so I recommend embracing Racing the cheesy musical stings, just live a little. The creators know what they're doing. I always do seem to find one, though. Yes, as I always do seem to find some cheesy act break. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, there's a common idea among people like me that there are no bad episodes of Firefly, which is nearly true. But I maintain that the episode Trash is... Wait, I had something for this. I'm kidding, but Trash is an inferior repeat heist episode after Ariel, and Saffron's character really irritates me here. It's not a bad episode, it's just a weird repetition, and rather unwelcome if we're only getting 14 episodes. Alright, I'm done. Okay, wait, 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 one more mistake. Firefly has the best blocking error of all time. Now, if we look carefully, I believe we'll see uh, Alan is not holding anything. <laughs> uh, nobody noticed. We had to pull the chair back to get the shot, and nobody noticed that he was miming it, and we still used it. <laughs> <laughs> but alright, Buster, I hear you say, arms still crossed and squinting at the screen. If you think the show is so good and has so few flaws, then why was it cancelled, smart guy? Simple. Firefly was brutally killed. Mishandled and poorly marketed and skewered in presentation to absolute shreds. This was done by 20th Century Fox, the same studio as I will never stop saying that had trouble marketing The Princess Bride, a perfect film that is made for basically everyone. I'm not sure how either of these things happened, and I know I'm being unreasonable, these two events probably had nothing in common, but how? I don't want answers, I want to be angry. He can't keep getting away with it! The show premiered when no one was sitting in front of their televisions, so no one knew it was on. The marketing material is so bad. What is this? Then, the studio didn't like the first episode, so they showed the second episode before anything else, and then they aired everything else out of order. Then they only showed 11 of the 14 episodes by the time the show was cancelled. This is unacceptable, F-, minus, the gold standard of tomfoolery. Firefly was stabbed in the gut before being released into the arena, and the fact that this profuse bleeding isn't apparent in the final product when viewed in the correct order is incredible. So make sure you watch the show in the intended order, because there are still some places that try and give you the wrong chronology. Be careful. The first thing you see should be a war, the last thing should be a man floating in outer space. Now, cancelling the show before its first season finale does leave certain questions unanswered, like what's going on with the Blue Sun Corporation? What's the deal with Shepard? What do all these hints mean? And why does the Alliance know him? Why is Inara on the ship? Why did she leave her life of luxury? Again, there are subtle hints of something. What's her deal? And that's not even including the big hints of future cool episodes that were going to happen, like if Jane got his own ship, or Zoe and Wash having the baby they were talking about. Heck, looking back, what compelled Mal to join the war? Okay, 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 okay. 
let's take a moment to rest. We've earned it. We've been together on this for a while, we've had some good times, but now's the part where I betray you. Here's the double cross. I'm going to say something that's going to shock nearly everyone who's seen Firefly, and I want you all to find it in your Kaylee to forgive me. All these unanswered questions do not need to damage your enjoyment of the show. Before I get to the controversial stuff, let me be clear. It makes me sad I don't get six seasons in a movie with these characters. Am I not supposed to have what I want? But no matter what you hear from fans, Firefly is not a half-form story, a half-creation that must be avoided. It is a pleasant and wonderful collection of stories that sadly were not continued. I don't need to know about Shepard Book's past to appreciate his character in the show. It works on its own. Same with Anara and everything else. See, Firefly has well-disciplined, strict episodic storytelling. And while it hints at a larger, overarching macro story, that isn't the central appeal. Each episode is satisfying on its own, with beginning, middle, and end. And that became less and less the norm. If I were to cancel shows like Daredevil, Chernobyl, Westworld, or Watchmen halfway through their first seasons, they would be fundamentally incomplete stories because they are telling a larger narrative with soft episodic divisions within seasons. Digital streaming made it easier to watch several episodes in one sitting, and so episodes increasingly felt more like chapters rather than complete stories on their own. I'm not saying that's inherently bad, I'm just saying Firefly isn't like this. Firefly has 14 episodes, and each of these fun little adventures stand on their own merits, because they expected people to only be able to watch an episode every week, or heaven forbid, possibly out of order. If just the episode Ariel popped up out of nowhere, I would be telling people everywhere to go check out this interesting little video that made a better, funnier heist short film than most blockbusters. Heart of Gold is a really interesting spaghetti western. And the message... Wow, the message might actually be my favorite. It's a heartbreaking episode of a veteran's life after his war, and his failure to help his family. Yeah. You weren't that far off about me being stupid. I never could get my life working right. Not once after the war. See, the reason I'm going rogue here is because I think fans of the show are going to argue with me on my larger point here. Firefly is, in many important ways, complete. I've heard some friends of mine really indulge in the tragedy of the show's cancellation, and I was told not to watch the show by the same person who told me they loved it. And it seems that many others were told the same, seemingly contradictory thing. We love it, don't watch it. And an element of that, strangely enough, is that the show itself kind of romanticizes this perspective. Because there's a curious similarity between the narrative of the story and the actual history of the show being made and watched today, long afterwards. Firefly, the show, is about survival and the joy of living freely, despite a great bureaucratic force's indifference and incompetence. Firefly, as a show, lived freely and enjoyed a short and glorious life before being cancelled by Fox's bureaucratic indifference and incompetence. The parallel is fascinating, and it naturally allows its fans to feel a connection with the bitter and tired Malcolm Reynolds, still indignant at a great injustice. Heck, on a surface level, it romanticizes this anger in a way that makes the fans being sad and upset seem like the correct response. It isn't. Fans, myself included, need to sometimes relax about this show. And I say that as someone who just spent a long time making a video about a show I like. We can make jokes, but I don't want people who have never seen the show to be discouraged from experiencing it because we are unnecessarily dramatic and saying things like, I wish the show never existed so I wouldn't be sad it's cancelled. What? Quit it. It was a good show. Be more like Kaylee. Be happy it existed and had such consistent quality. My bunker is filled with stories that were continued for far too long. In a world of geek oversaturation, Firefly is a strangely welcome change. I don't understand. How much is enough Doctor Who? We have like 19 Doctor- We got 11 hours of Firefly proper. And we even got an extra movie, Serenity, to wrap up a lot of the plot threads. Not, not all the plot threads, but some central ones. Now, I haven't been talking much about this movie, despite it being the finale of the Firefly television show and Joss Whedon's farewell to the universe before Mickey Mouse made a terrible reboot show in 2032 that we don't want to talk about. Anyway, this may make it seem like I don't like the film. Actually, I like it a lot. As a film made to conclude a show that was cancelled two years earlier, it does a lot of things right. It's fun and exciting, and it's clearly a heartfelt farewell from the show's original writers and cast. I'm genuinely really grateful this exists. But as much as I appreciate it providing answers to questions like what's going on with River and the Alliance, my brain never really digests this film as part of the Firefly series proper, and I finally figured out why. Don't get me wrong, you should probably watch this film with every Firefly rewatch, but it feels like a different beast. Firefly, the show, is about episodic, pulpy space cowboy adventures and warm lighting. Serenity, the film, is a tight, dramatic, conclusive finale to the show's world building in really weird, cold lighting. I feel like I need a jacket just watching this. It's a surprisingly dour film. It's a proper drama, and while being a successful finale event, it doesn't feel like more Firefly. It heavily implies a few seasons happened between the episodes we saw and now, because a lot of these characters are in a much different place than when we left them. I know why this was done, the director's commentary is helpful on this, and I agree with the reasoning. It allows them character arcs, you know, drama. But the Simon I know and love gets punched a lot. One, two, three, four. Can I have a little more? 
Simon in the movie has grown a lot and is now angrily punching the captain. He must have had a difficult season 3. What happened to the boy who got bullied by Jane all the time? He grew up too fast. And similarly, Malcolm is in a pretty dark place here, and the writers are actually quite clear that this is a Malcolm who has abandoned some of the principles that really established his character in the show proper. If I ever kill you, you'll be awake. You'll be facing me, and you'll be armed. I'm unarmed. Good. This is a good movie. It has good comedic moments, and its action is way better than the show. I'm glad to live in a world where I got to see River become the angel of death killing space zombies in a way she was always supposed to become in the show. What a time to be alive. But the film wisely doesn't try and recapture the central goofiness of Space Cowboys. And that goofiness, that comfort, is the beating heart of Firefly. Each of the positive elements of the show I've been talking about, from the crew dynamics to the political background to the emphasis on fun and the simple joys in life, is all fundamentally in service of building this home. A place in time and space that people can enjoy and call their own. And while Malcolm is a man recovering from the end of his world and is learning to have faith in the world around him, the real moral center of this ship is Kaylee, who already does. See, I told you it was Kaylee. The, the answer was inside of us all along. Firefly the show is a lot like the ship it tells the story of. It's a place to be, an environment to enjoy. It has no right to be nearly as comfortable as it is. It's basically a cramped submarine in space, but it still manages to feel alive. It may not be as impressive or big or expensive as the others, but that beautiful little firefly has more care and character than most other shows have in seven seasons. The metaphor, it's crumbling! Look at how different each character's room is. Notice the painstaking lengths the show goes to demonstrate the architecture and the way the rooms are connected to one another, the space between them. All these beautiful little details and quirks helps me understand why I'm so drawn to rewatch Firefly again. Instead of slogging through whatever seasons-long, critically acclaimed misery show got all the awards, I'm sorry, Max, I'm not watching any more Walking Dead. It never ends! Perhaps you're watching this video in better times, but here, stuck in this terrible year, when the world feels like it's ended and we're all stuck in cramped spaces, avoiding the mistakes of larger forces outside our bunkers, Firefly makes sense. It draws my inner adolescent out with silly jokes and shootouts and dumb, campy fun, and then it reminds me to finally enjoy the simple things, to appreciate that which I still have, and to just cheer up. The heart and soul of the show isn't Malcolm. It's Kaylee. Because Kaylee isn't just a positive character, or some delicate figure that can be admired for its purity. Remember, this isn't about how likable she is, it's about how she helps the story. And Kaylee is a thematic culmination of basically everything that Firefly values. Kaylee is the one literally holding the mechanical vehicle itself together, the one who genuinely loves the ship and gets upset when people make jokes about it. Serenity ain't Lissa. There's an interesting theme running through the series where some people call Serenity garbage, and others recognize it as the sort of ship that can fly forever. I needn't tell you that one of the biggest things separating the common man from the wealthy snobs of the world is the ability to appreciate a reliable vehicle, rather than a pretty one. Kaylee is Firefly at its best in being the fantasy of a self-taught, self-determined craftsman and being a brilliant female mechanic. Kaylee always loved the ship. She always appreciated the little things, whether eating strawberries or chasing after what makes her happy, in direct contradiction to Malcolm's hang-ups, repressed guilt, and inability to express himself. She brings out the best in every character from Malcolm's leadership to River's wonder, even, somehow, Jane's affection. Kaylee never fought in war against anyone. She came from a poor planet and is just happy to be here in the first place, just like us. If Malcolm is the gruff expression of defiance and heroism against the Alliance's snobbery and indifference, a character important in showing what it means to stand for in one's beliefs no matter how helpless things seem, Kaylee is the living culmination of everything he fought for. Firefly is a show about time, and no one appreciates time aboard Serenity more than Kaylee. And one day, I hope I can appreciate the space I'm in as much as Kaylee does every day. That would be enough. Is that... is that Zac Efron?